Starting off at number 5, Burning at the Stake. By far the most well known punishment for those tried as witches, burning at the stake was a cruel and unusual form of execution used commonly back during the many witch trials of the 17th century. These executions were not only physically agonizing, but also symbolized the depths of human fear and prejudice. One such example of this terrible practice was the Würzburg Witch Trials of the 17th century, known as one of the largest witch trials in history. Accused witches faced a horrifying fate at the stake. The authorities believed that fire possessed the purifying power to cleanse the accused of their alleged connections to the devil. In reality, it was a grotesque display of violence. Victims were often tied to wooden stakes in a public square, surrounded by jeering crowds. They were subjected to unimaginable pain as the flames slowly consumed them. The agony of being burnt alive was drawn out, excruciating, and inhumane. What made the burning of witches particularly cruel was the complete absence of credible evidence. The trials were fueled by paranoia, superstition, and hysteria. Accusations were often based on flimsy hearsay, personal grudges, or even just random suspicions. The accused had little chance to defend themselves, and confessions were often extracted through rigorous mental and physical torment. These false confessions only added to the tragedy, as innocent people were forced to implicate themselves and others in a desperate attempt to end their suffering. Furthermore, the persecution of witches during the Würzburg witch trials, like many other witch hunts, was often intertwined with gender bias. Women, especially Especially those who didn't conform the societal norms were disproportionately targeted. Accusations of witchcraft could be used to control and punish women who challenged the status quo or were perceived as a threat to male authority. The cruelty of burning witches at the stake was not limited to the physical torment. It was a gruesome spectacle, intended to terrify the populace into submission. Public executions were meant to send a message that dissent would not be tolerated and that conformity to prevailing religious and social norms was imperative. The psychological impact on society society was profound, as fear and mistrust tore communities apart. The Würzburg witch trials, like many others, were eventually recognized as a dark chapter in history. They serve as a stark reminder of the dangers of mass hysteria, religious fantasism, and the absence of due process. Today we look back on these events with horror and regret, vowing never to repeat the cruelty of burning alleged witches at the stake. It is a somber lesson that underscores the importance of justice, reason, and compassion in our pursuit of a more enlightened society. Next up at number 4. Witch cakes. Witch cakes are a bizarre and unsettling aspect of the witch trials that swept through colonial America during the 17th century, as exemplified in the infamous case of Tituba. These cakes, concocted from peculiar ingredients, were believed to possess the power to reveal the presence of witches. While they may seem like a bizarre footnote in history, witch cakes serve as a chilling reminder of the hysteria and irrationality that fueled the witch trials. In the case of Tituba, a slave woman living in Salem, Massachusetts, witch cakes played a central role in her ordeal. Tituba was accused of practicing witchcraft, and her accuser sought a means to expose her supposed demonic affiliations. They decided to bake a witch cake, a crude mixture of rye meal and the urine of the afflicted girls who claimed to be victims of witchcraft. Ew. The logic behind these cakes was deeply flawed and rooted in superstition. It was believed that by feeding the cake to a dog, the dog would act as a conduit, causing the witch to experience pain and reveal their true nature. This bizarre form of witch detection demonstrates the length of which fear and paranoia can drive people to concoct irrational and cruel methods of persecution. Tituba was subjected to this ordeal, and when the dog exhibited unusual behavior, you know, because it was eating urine, it was seen as evidence of her guilt. This marked the beginning of her traumatic journey through the Salem witch trials, which ultimately led to her confession under duress. The use of witch cakes underscores the hysteria and desperation that characterized the witch trials. Accusers and authorities were willing to resort to absurd and unscientific methods to justify their persecution of those they believed to be witches. These methods were not only illogical, but also cruel, as they subjected the accused to public humiliation, physical examinations, and often torment. In third place we have a ducking chair, not to be confused with a cucking chair, which is a whole other concept, or the red hot stools woman accused of having sexual acts with the devil would have to sit on. I sadly don't have enough information to unpack that stool, other than ouch. But um, let's get on with the ducking, shall we? The ducking stool was a strongly made wooden armchair, often made out of oak, in which the offender was seated, with an iron band being placed around them so that they would uh, not fall out during their immersion. How 
thorough. The earliest record of the use of such is towards the beginning of the 17th century, with the term first being attested in English in 1597. It was used both in Europe and in the English colonies of North America. Usually the chair was fastened to a long wooden beam fixed as like a seesaw on the edge of a pond or river. And as much as I love and miss wooden playgrounds, I feel like this might not have been as fun. Sometimes the ducking stool was not a fixture, but was mounted on a pair of wooden wheels so that it could be wheeled through the streets, and at the river edge was hung by a chain from the end of a beam. In sentencing a woman, the magistrates ordered the number of ducking she should have, and as much as I've scoured the internet, I can't seem to find number data on this. If you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments. Another type of ducking stool was called a tumbrel, and was a chair on two wheels with two long shafts fixed to the axles. This was pushed into the pond, and then the shafts would be released, ergo tipping the chair up backwards. Sometimes the punishment proved fatal and the subject died. Once again, the um, sometimes, should be taken with a pound of salt. In medieval times until the early 18th century, ducking was a way used to establish whether a suspect was a witch. The ducking stools were first used for this purpose, but ducking was later inflicted without the chair. In this instance, the subject's right thumb was bound to her left big toe, her left thumb to her right big toe, a rope was tied around the waist of the accused, and she was thrown into a river or a deep pond. If she floated, it was deemed that she was in league with the devil, rejecting the baptismal water. If she sank, she was cleared. Oh, and she'd be dead. Can't forget that part. Silly me. In second place, we have witch mark hunting and pricking. Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. This devil's mark could supposedly change shape and color and was believed to be numb and insensitive to pain. Prosecutors might also search for the witch's teat, which was an extra nipple allegedly used to suckle the witch's helper animals. In both cases, it was really easy for even the most minor physical imperfections to be labeled as the work of the devil himself. Oh my, the horror. Moles, scars, birthmarks, sores, and tattoos could all qualify. So examiners really came up empty handed. I'm trying to think of just how many birthmarks I have all over my body. So just add that to the tally of how I'm, you know, a witch. Seriously, I feel the burning from the flames already. In the midst of witch hunts, desperate villagers would sometimes even burn or cut off any offending marks on their bodies, only to have their wounds labeled as proof of a covenant with the devil. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. If I'm adding like scars to my blemish count, yeah, forget it. Okay, I think the temperature in here just went up another couple of degrees. Seriously. If witch hunters struggled to find obvious evidence of witch's marks on a suspect's body, they might resort to the ghastly practice of pricking as a means of, you know, sussing it out. Come on! Even having a flawless body isn't going to exonerate you? What the heck? Witch hunting books and instructional pamphlets noted that the marks were insensitive to pain and couldn't bleed, so examiners used specially designed needles to repeatedly stab and prick at the accused person's flesh until they discovered a spot that produced the desired results. In England and Scotland, the punishment was eventually performed by well-paid professional prickers, many of whom were actually con men who used adult needle points to identify fake witches' marks. Well then, if you ever feel like your job just, you know, isn't real, remember that people in history were paid to do well. Along with pricking, the unfortunate suspect might also be subjected to scratching by their supposed victims. This test was based on the notion that possessed people found relief by scratching the person responsible with their fingernails until they um, drew fluid. If their symptoms improved after clawing at the accused skin, it was seen as partial evidence of guilt. No, no, absolutely not. I can't see anyone being proven innocent whatsoever from this nonsense. Talk about a bias court. In first place, we have dismemberment and mutilation. This is where my own stomach gets all topsy-turvy, so fair warning. I can handle creepy stuff, no problem. But gore? There is a reason I haven't been able to bring myself to watch the Terror Fire movies. So when witch hunters wanted to get answers back in the day, if I haven't made it clear enough by now, they didn't really care about being humane or, you know, coercion, just being right. They would do whatever they deemed necessary to get a confession, leading many witches to confess just to make the pain stop and end their lives, well, Humanely, say goodbye to your fingernails because that was practically just a footnote in what they were allowed to do. While Perga Hosmanin of Bavaria was led through multiple different stages of mutilation while being paraded to her execution. At the first stop, her left breast and right arm were branded with irons, then her right breast at the second stop, her left arm at the third, with her left hand being then branded at the fourth stop. Once they reached the place of execution, her right hand, with uh, which she had made her oath as a midwife, was cut off before she was finally burned alive at the stake. Oh, her ashes were not allowed to remain on soil. 
but they were just, you know, dumped in a stream. Probably the most extreme extent of this was a punishment normally reserved for killers, but exceptions were made for witches who confessed without torture to crimes deemed brutal enough for it. Are y'all ready for this? The offender would be strapped to four horses, with one arm or leg attached to each separate horse, and then on command, the horses would start running and rip the offender's arms and legs off. The person would die somehow, and painfully through life source and uh, limb loss. And on that note, we've reached the end of our time. Number five, greed. In Dante's Inferno, the punishment for the sin of greed is deeply relentless. The souls guilty of the sin of greed find themselves in the fourth circle of hell, a wasteland covered in darkness. Here, their punishment acts as a cycle of endless torment. Imagine a desolate expanse where the ground quakes beneath your feet and mournful cries fill the air. The sin-filled souls are forced into a never-ending, mercilessly agonizing activity. They labor eternally, pushing colossal weights and massive boulders towards each other. Their efforts are in vain, as the immense burdens never yield to their toil, forever reenacting the insatiable pursuit of wealth that consumed them in life. Greed is enforced by the endless futility of their labor, always striving for a goal that they are never going to be able to reach. Their faces contort with anguish, and their bodies bear the scars of their physical exertion. In this realm, the chase for material gain that defined their lives is mirrored by the perpetual, impossible goal they now fight to achieve. Both sides of the rocks had an imbalanced lifestyle. Consuming too much, wanting too much, taking too much, you know, greedy. Both sides handled money incorrectly, having an unbalanced lifestyle, so they are forced to survive in the middle ground for all of eternity. This circle of hell illustrates how the insatiable hunger for wealth, pursued at the expense of all else, ultimately leads to an empty and agonizing existence. The souls trapped here in this torment are a reminder of the lifestyle that supports placing inconsequential material possessions above all else. Yeah, I know a couple of people that may end up in this circle. 1%. So sorry. Something's caught in my throat. Gosh, I'm so sorry about that. Let's move on. <laughs> Number four, gluttony. The punishment for gluttony is a reminder of the excesses and indulgences that mark the lives of the guilty souls trapped here. These souls find themselves in the second circle of hell, where their punishment is a vivid portrayal of the consequences of their overconsumption. This desolate landscape is consistently drenched in a never-ending rain, a chilling and ceaseless downpour. Here, the gluttonous souls wallow in the muck and filth, standing in garbage that is being composted by worms crawling under their feet, representing the waste and excess of their earthly lives. They are forever submerged in a vile slush, with their bodies weighed down by the constant rain, unable to rise or find any refuge from their torment. A torment that is only made worse by the knowledge that the waste they stand in is their own, waste that they caused in their gluttonous life. The punishment for gluttony is a cycle of discomfort and misery, a reflection of the appetites that drove these individuals to overindulge in food, drink, and experiences during their mortal existence. It serves as a visual metaphor for the emptiness that comes from an unrestrained pursuit of pleasures. As Dante and his guide Virgil navigate through this circle, the suffering souls are marked by their emaciated and pitiful appearances. Their desires are now replaced by an unending sense of wanting to be anywhere else and an uneasy discomfort. The consequence for gluttony is a cautionary perspective, is a cautionary perspective shifting tale surrounding excessive consumption and the pursuit of physical pleasure. These desires ultimately lead to an existence defined by misery, filled with and fueled by the consequences of their own actions. Number three, dunking. Dunking was a cruel and unusual punishment employed during the witch trials that swept through Europe and its colonies in the 16th and 17th centuries, including Northamptonshire, England. This brutal practice, also known as ducking or swimming, was intended to determine an individual's guilt or innocence of witchcraft, but it often resulted in severe physical and psychological suffering. In Northamptonshire and other regions, dunking involved binding the accused witch, often a woman, and lowering her into a body of water, typically a river or pond. The rationale behind this test was rooted in superstition and flawed logic. It was believed that because witches had renounced their baptism, the pure element of water would reject them causing them to float. If the accused floated, they were seen as guilty of witchcraft. If they sank, they were deemed innocent, but often drowned in the process. Being forcibly dunked in the cold water while bound was a terrifying and painful experience. The accused would struggle for air and face the risk of drowning, all while the onlookers watched in morbid anticipation. Dunking was an arbitrary and irrational method of determining guilt. The outcome depended on various factors, such as the accused body's composition and the skill of the dunking implement. 
implementers. Innocent people could easily be declared guilty, leading to wrongful executions. Despite its cruelty and lack of reliability, dunking persisted in witch trials because it was consistent with the prevailing belief in the supernatural and the desire for swift justice. It was only with the eventual decline of witch hunts and the advent of more rational legal systems that such inhumane practices were abandoned. At number 2, Prayer Tests Prayer tests stand as the greatest example of the unjust nature of the witch trials and the persecution of innocent individuals, making it a cruel punishment for anyone put on trial. They were a controversial and often absurd method used during the witch trials to supposedly rule out witches. These tests were grounded in superstition and religious fervor rather than sound evidence. Two notable cases, those of Jane Wenham and George Burroughs, shed light on the use and cruel consequences of such prayer tests during witch trials. Jane Wenham's case is one of the last witch trials in England, occurring in 1712. She was accused of witchcraft in Hertfordshire, and her trial attracted considerable attention due to the changing climate of skepticism regarding witch trials. One of the methods employed to test her guilt or innocence was the prayer test. In Wenham's trial, the prayer test involved having the accused recite the Lord's Prayer without error usually out of the Bible or other holy texts. It was believed that a witch would be unable to utter the prayer correctly due to their alleged unholy nature. However, this test was deeply flawed and arbitrary, as it ignored the fact that many accused witches were uneducated and might struggle with reading the Lord's Prayer, especially in the intense and stressful environment of a trial. She also underwent dunking in order to test her witchy nature. Fortunately, Jane Wenham was found not guilty, thanks to the rising skepticism surrounding witchcraft. Even when accused of flying, the judge would retort, is flying a crime? Which it isn't. Her case is often cited as a turning point in England's witch trials, as it exposed the irrationality and injustice of such proceedings. But in the case of George Burroughs in 1692, he wasn't so lucky. George Burroughs was one of the individuals accused and executed during the Salem witch trials in colonial Massachusetts. His case highlights how the prayer test was used in the American context. In Burroughs' trial, the authorities used the Lord's Prayer as a test of his innocence. They believed that if he couldn't recite it correctly, he must be a which. Burroughs, to the astonishment of many, recited the prayer flawlessly, challenging the validity of the test. However, the court, fueled by hysteria and prejudice, dismissed this as a trick of the devil. So much for testing him, right? George Burroughs was ultimately convicted and hanged, illustrating how even when an accused individual passed the prayer test, it did not it did not guarantee their acquittal or protection from the witch hunt's irrationality. So yeah, if you were wanted dead back then, you would be made dead. And at number one, crushing. In the annals of history, the Salem witch trials of 1692 stand as a stark testament to humanity's capacity for cruelty, particularly in the realm of legal punishment. Amid the hysteria that gripped colonial Massachusetts, a plethora of cruel and unusual methods were employed to elicit confessions from the accused witches. Among these harrowing practices, the use of pressing or crushing remains one of the most chilling. The process of pressing was as brutal as it was inhumane. The accused individual would be stripped of all dignity and laid down in a dark, dank cell. Heavy stones or wooden boards, laden with an unimaginable weight, would then be stacked upon their chest. The agony that followed was beyond words. As the relentless pressure bore down, every grasp for breath became a desperate struggle. The rationale behind this method was chillingly simplistic. Those who confessed to their alleged dealings with the devil could halt the pressing, while those who resisted would face an excruciating demise. The authorities, consumed by fear and paranoia, believed that witches, having supposedly consorted with Satan, possessed a supernatural resilience that rendered them impervious to such torment. The cruelty of pressing was evident not only in its physical brutality, but also in its stark absence of due process. Accused witches had no chance to defend themselves, no legal representation, and no recourse to justice. Their fates rested in the hands of accusers and a court swayed by mass hysteria and irrational beliefs. Perhaps the most infamous case of pressing during the Salem witch trials was that of Giles Corey. A resilient and principled man, Corey refused to enter a plea, knowing that doing so would lead to the forfeiture of his property. His stoic resistance, in the face of a slow and agonizing death, made him a symbol of defiance against the unjust trials. In fifth place, we have witch cakes to kick us off. Sadly, these aren't yummy Halloween cakes, a thought which makes me very hungry, <laughs> but instead a bizarre form of counter magic, a supernatural dessert used to identify suspected evildoers. In cases of mysterious illness or possession, witch hunters would take a sample of the victim's urine, mix it with rye meal and ashes, and bake it into a cake. This stomach-turning concoction was then fed to a familiar or 
or animal helper of the suspected witch in the hopes that the creature would fall under its spell and reveal the name of the guilty sorcerer. During the hysteria that preceded the Salem witch trials, Tichuba famously helped prepare a witch cake to identify the person responsible for bewitching young Betty Paris and others. The brew failed to work, and Tichuba's knowledge of spells and folk remedies was later used as evidence against her when she was accused of being a witch. Before I forget, another use for a witch cake came from burning the pastry in hopes that the scorching heat would transfer to the witch and force her to reveal herself. Whew. Anybody else starting to get warm? Oh great, just me. In fourth place, we have a scold's bridle. Also known as a witch's bridle, a gossip's bridle, a brink's bridle, or simply brinks, this was an instrument of punishment as a form of public humiliation. This thing was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head. Some exceptions were masks that depicted suffering, but not pleasant either way. My brain just jumped to a similar modern device used for pleasure instead of pain, and no, I will not elaborate on that thought, but let's clarify. A bridal bit, or curb plate, around 5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters in size, was slid into the mouth and pressed down on top of the tongue, often with a spike on the tongue as a compress. It functioned to silence the wearer from speaking entirely, and caused extreme pain and physiological trauma to scare and intimidate the wearer into submission. This prevented speaking and resulted in many unpleasant side effects for the wearer, including excessive salivation and fatigue in the mouth. Seeing as I've always been a chatty Cathy, I can totally see how I would have been sentenced to this, and my jaw hurts just thinking about it. The wearer was then led around the town by a leash, and for extra humiliation, a bell could also be attached to um, draw in crowds. First recorded in Scotland in 1567, the brinks were also used in England and its colonies. The Kirk Sessions in Barony Courts in Scotland inflicted the contraption mostly on female transgressors, and women considered to be rude, nags, common scolds, drunken, but mostly witches. It was also used as corporal punishment for other offenses, notably on female workhouse inmates. The person to be punished was placed in a public place for additional humiliation and sometimes beaten. Just sometimes, not every time apparently. Knowing what I know about history and cover-ups, I'm going to lean towards probably most of the time. The Lanark Berg records record a typical example of the punishment being used. When wearing the device, it was, yep, impossible for the person to either eat or speak. Other pranks included an adjustable gag with a sharp edge, causing any movement of the mouth to result in laceration of the tongue. In Scotland, pranks could also be permanently displayed in public by attaching them, for example, to the town cross, tron, or toll booth. Then the ritual humiliation would take place, with the miscreant on public display. Displaying the pranks in public was intended to remind the populace of the consequences of any rash action or slander. Whether the person was paraded or simply taken Taken to the point of punishment, the process of humiliation and expected repentance was the same. Time spent in the brittle was normally allocated by the Kirk Session, in Scotland or by a local magistrate. Number three, heresy. Heresy gets a very special treatment as a sin. It's like nothing you have ever seen. Hopefully, nothing like you've ever seen. Heresy, which essentially means holding beliefs contrary to the official religious doctrine, is placed in the sixth circle of hell. And no, it's not hearsay, like some other clearly unintelligent girl on this channel once said, because that's ridiculous and nobody would ever be able to confuse the two words. If you're a frequent watcher and you think I'm talking about myself, no I'm not. The girl who said hearsay was fired for her mistake. We take pronunciation very seriously here, obviously. In this circle of hell, heretics are condemned to reside in flaming tombs eternally, where they are scorched by the burning, searing heat. These tombs are adorned with etchings that deny the soul's immortality, symbolizing their defiance of orthodox Christian teachings, and honestly being pretty sarcastic. The souls trapped here rejected core Christian beliefs, and so, of course, their retribution reflects this rejection. They're left in a state of perpetual suffering, unable to escape the heat. The intensity of the fire mirrors the intensity of their heretical beliefs, which challenge the fundamental tenets of faith. As Dante journeys through this circle, he encounters souls who dared to question the fundamental truths of faith. The flaming tombs stand as a testament to the lasting impact of such blasphemous heretical beliefs, a reminder of the price paid for defying religious doctrine. It's a grim reminder of the consequences of deviating from established religious beliefs. The heretics thought they could define their own spiritual path, but now they're ensnared in their own fiery defiance. Dante's depiction of the underworld for heresy serves as a warning about the dangers of challenging religious orthodoxy, the enduring torment that results from rejecting core beliefs, and is a display of the consequences of heretical thinking. Yeah, I'm ending up here for sure, no doubt about it. But you know, whatever, I'll probably get a nice tan or something. Number two, Limbo. Limbo is where Dante's Inferno all begins. It's the first circle of hell and the home of the unbaptized and virtuous pagans. These souls weren't exactly sinners, but they didn't receive a free pass to heaven either. In Limbo, you'll 
you'll find a lush and serene meadow, like the one in Twilight, I assume. But don't be fooled by the scenery. The souls here are stuck in a seemingly pleasant but ultimately melancholic state. They're not getting the full heavenly experience, but they're not suffering either. It's a bit like being in eternal waiting. Here's the catch though. These souls are forever denied the presence of God. They're on the outskirts of salvation, so close but just out of reach. The pain comes from the knowledge that they will never attain true divine union. It's a place where people of great moral character who lived before the time of Christ, like virtuous pagans, philosophers, and even people who died before baptism end up. Limbo is not the typical tormenting affair you'll see in the other circles of hell I'll be going through. It's more of a spiritual longing, a forever sense of being almost there, almost in serenity, but not quite. These souls will never experience fulfillment of divine love. The first circle is sort of a liminal space, a waiting room for the afterlife. It's a reminder that even if you led a virtuous life, without Christian faith, you can't access the ultimate rewards of heaven. This place shows Limbo is waiting as a starting point, showing us that not all souls in hell are tormented. Some are just left in a state of longing and never quite attaining the ultimate divine presence. It's an interesting exploration of the moral and spiritual implications of faith and the consequences of being outside its fold. Eee! Oh, okay, so I'm going here then. That's okay. It'll be like Twilight forever. Would vampires be chilling here or would they be somewhere else? Like, is there like a special inferno for the supernatural species? Probably. I guess I'll bring my own glitter paint and I'll make myself an Alice Cullen while I'm there. Number one, treachery. Treachery is the ninth and final circle of hell, the deepest and coldest place where the very worst offenders end up. It is a frozen, icy wasteland, an environment so brutally cold that it easily numbs the very soul of its occupants. In this place, you'll find the souls of traitors, people who betrayed the trust of others in the most despicable way. Dante's got four zones here, each with its own specially designed form of treachery. Cana. This first zone is named after Cain, the biblical figure who committed the first act of killing by taking his brother Abel's life. In Cana, the traitors to their family are frozen up to their necks in the icy lake. They're basically stuck, unable to move, with only their heads peeking out of the icy prison. Antonora. This is the zone for those who betrayed their homeland or political allies. Here, these souls are also frozen in ice, but up to their eyes. They're sort of like living popsicles, their vision completely blocked by the ice. This zone is for those who betrayed their guests. The souls here lie on their backs on the frozen ground with their faces pointed upwards. It's a posture that reflects their betrayal since they were supposed to be welcoming hosts. Yikes. You better throw good parties, guys. I know some people who may end up here. Like, what do you mean you threw a party without dips for the chips? That's betrayal right there. Betrayal of the highest degree. Judeca. At the very center of this icy realm, you've got the worst of the worst. This is where the traitors to their masters, like Satan himself, end up. Satan's trapped here too, and he's got three sinners he's chewing on. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, and Brutus and Cassius, who betrayed Julius Caesar. Treachery is all about the cold, a numbing and isolating sensation. It reflects the ultimate betrayal of trust, where personal bonds were severed in the most heinous, despicable ways, like not having chip dip. Here, you can't escape the icy cold and you're stuck with the consequences of your treacherous actions for all of eternity. 